respected students, I was just talking to Brother Salim here, and we were discussing that, you know, the object of our course, to, at the end of the day, the object of our course is to be able to give da'wah. That when we meet this, the Christian, when we meet someone of another religion, we must be able to engage him in a fruitful way. We must be able to present the message of Islam to him. And so for the first four lessons, we haven't really gotten into that, that yet. And I don't want students to get um, to feel like, you know, we're not going anywhere with this. Because inshallah, in the next four or five sessions, we will be dealing with the Bible. We will be dealing with how to talk with Christians. But just for now, I feel like it's important for us to get a background for us to understand what is the Bible, how do the Christians view the Bible, who really wrote the Bible, can we rely upon it. So all of these things come first as you know our basis, our introduction. Because when you're giving da'wah to the Christian, one of the easiest things or the easiest lines to go down is to show him that you know your Bible that you have in front of you, it's not a reliable source of information. So as we saw in the last presentation, the, these books of the Bible were only put into this book form 300 years after Jesus. Some random people decided this is from God, this is not from God. So the, one of the easiest lines to go down is to show him, see there's contradictions. This was written how many years after Jesus? How can this be a reliable source of information? How can this be divine? If you break his trust in that book, in the Bible, then you already won. Then now you can show him the Quran, it's very easy from there. So this is, it's, it's important also for us to get this understanding of the Gospels, what are the Gospels, what, are the Bible, what is the Bible. So as we were discussing last week, just a quick recap. If you're going to have your Bible in front of you, you're going to open the contents page, you're going to see it broken up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Jewish scriptures. In there you'll find the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the story of Dawood, you'll find the story of Lut alayhi salam, Shuaib alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, going right down till the prophet uh, Malachi. That's the last prophet of the Jews. That's the Old Testament. And we're going to deal with that, or you will deal with it in the section on Judaism. The New Testament is what we're focusing on, because the Christian, he accepts all the prophets before him, but now he has his New Testament. As we discussed, the New Testament is made up of 27 books. The first four are the Gospels, and that's what we're going to discuss today, these four Gospels, because this is the crux of Christianity. Everything you want to know about Jesus, everything the Christian wants to know about Jesus, comes from these four Gospels. Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But now we need to ask some questions about these Gospels because these are four independent biographies about Jesus. Four, so Matthew, what did he do? He said, let me write about the life of Jesus from when he was born, what happened after that, how he preached, the miracles he did, and then eventually he was raised up to heaven. Mark did the same, Luke did the same, John did the same. Now these four independent, separate. They didn't know each other. They never met each other. They wrote these four biographies of Jesus. And eventually some Christians later down, uh, down the line said, this is from God, and they put it in their book. Now we need to ask some questions about these four Gospels. Why do we attribute these Gospels to these four men? Why is it called the Gospel of Matthew? Do we have a note from Matthew saying he wrote this, number one? Who is Matthew in the first place that the Christians are talking about? So we need to know why is it called the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Second question, who is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Third question, or the second one that I have here, what is the evidence of the Christians that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote these books? The third question is, do scholars today accept what the Christians are saying? And our question for us is, on what basis do we reject what the Christians are saying? So this is going to be the crux of our discussion today. Is these four Gospels, who really wrote them? How do we know who wrote them? Who is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? What is our stance on these four Gospels? And before we head into this whole thing, because last week a very, very pertinent question was asked, so I think I'm going to just reiterate the answer again. The brother asked that many times when we're quoting from the Bible, a Christian will come up to you and tell you, see, you don't believe in this book, why are you <coughs> quoting from it? Or you're quoting from the Bible, you, what, you believe in the Bible or something, why are you quoting from the Bible? Very, very common question you'll ask. When you show the Christian, see, John says, in John, Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. So he doesn't have an answer, so he'll tell you, but why are you quoting from the Gospel? You don't accept this, you don't believe in this. 
So because it's a very common question and the brother asked it last week, I thought I'm just going to reiterate the answer. So if someone asks you that you don't believe in the Bible, so why are you quoting from it? So what's our response to this? Our response to this is, number one, what do you mean by believe? If by believe you mean I think it's from God, then I don't believe in, I don't believe in this Bible. I don't believe this is from God. But do I have to believe that a book is from God to quote it? Every uh, research paper you write, they're quoting from this source, that source, that source. Do they believe all these sources are from God? When I'm reading a history book, I quote from the history book. Do I have to believe it's from God to quote from it? No, obviously not. But if, by, if when they ask you, do you believe in the Bible, why are you quoting it? If by believe you mean, I think it contains some truth, then yes, like any historical document that was written, the author sometimes will have the truth, sometimes he won't have the truth. And Quran explains this to us. Quran says, وَآتَيْنَا Injil. We gave the Injil to Isa alayhi salam. But Quran also tells us, يُحَرِّفُونَ الْكَلِمَ عَمَّ مَوَاضِعِهِ That, you know what, they change the message. So these Gospels we have in front of us, they're not the same revelation that was given to Isa alayhi salam. They are changed and distorted version, but the truth is in there somewhere. Because Quran tells us this. So when we quote from this, why are we quoting from this? Number one, we're quoting from it to show that even though it's changed a little bit, but it doesn't support your belief as a Christian. You saying Trinity, Incarnation, everything, nothing like that in these books. So we're quoting from it, number one, to show you that you are misunderstanding these books, not because we believe in it. And number two, because the Quran tells us that the description of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is here, so we will find it here, so we will quote these books. It doesn't mean we have to believe it's from God to quote it. To quote it. So that's the basic answer. That it's, it's like the way the question is asked is, you don't believe in it, so why are you quoting it? So they're trying to say, before you quote something, you have to believe it's from God. But that's false. Anyone can understand. That doesn't make sense. So understand that question itself is flawed, then it'll be easy for you to answer it. So now let's go through these five um, sort of topics that we're going to discuss today. So the first gospel is the gospel of Matthew. Now, in the, from, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to give you the Christian perspective, not our perspective yet. I'm going to tell you what the Christian believes. What does he think in his mind? When you tell him Matthew, what's the belief in his head? We're going to go through that first. And then we're going to discuss the response to that. So, when you say Matthew, who's Matthew? Gospel of Matthew. So, Matthew, according to the Christian, is a disciple of Jesus. By disciple, we mean like how we say Sahaba for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, he was like someone who was a part of the 12 disciples. The Quran calls them the Hawariyin. According to the Christian, the Gospel of Matthew is written by the same Matthew who was a disciple of Jesus. And in the Gospels, when you read, Matthew is mentioned very or rarely, he's mentioned maybe three or four times, that he was a tax collector, meaning he used to collect tax for the Romans. And eventually Jesus was walking past him, and Jesus told him, drop everything you're doing and join me. And he left everything and he joined Jesus, and he became a disciple of Jesus. And according to them, this same person, this disciple, wrote this Gospel. Now, why are, we, why are we even getting into this discussion? Because it makes a big difference. Think about it. If a disciple of Jesus wrote this gospel, then that means it's very likely to be true. If Matthew, who lived with Jesus for so many years, really wrote this gospel, then why shouldn't we trust what he's saying? You understand? But if we can prove that it wasn't Matthew, but it was someone who lived 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, then we don't have to believe what this thing is saying. So that's the whole, that's where the discussion is going. So the Christian, he believes Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, wrote this. He was a tax collector and he's mentioned a few times in the Gospels. Now what's the evidence that Matthew wrote this? And I want us to think critically. I only mentioned a few here, but the main evidence they'll tell you is, no, no, you see, one of the church fathers, remember we discussed church fathers, that's like the Salaf al basically for them it's like the early scholars of Christianity who they look up to, one of the church fathers who lived in the 400s. Now remember Jesus lived from 0 to 33, basically around there. In the 400s, we have a Christian scholar called Eusebius. He's writing in his book, and he quotes a second century scholar called Papias. I know there's a lot of names being thrown around here. But just understand because this is their dalil. This is, this, this is their evidence. That in the 4th century we have this book from this 
historian. He's quoting a second century scholar, Papias, and he says that Matthew wrote a gospel. That's all he says. That's the number one Dalit, number one piece of evidence, is that in Eusebius quotes Papias saying Matthew wrote a gospel. No real evidence, because remember, all the manuscripts we have, there's no name written on it. We have no way of really knowing who wrote this. So the Christian provides this as his evidence that no, the later church fathers in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, they said Matthew wrote it. But I'm not going to discuss whether that's valid or not, but you need to think about it. Is this a valid piece of evidence or is it not a valid piece of evidence? The third one is also a bit of a strange one. They say, you know, you see Matthew in the, in the Gospels when we read the story, he was a tax collector. Therefore, he was very organized. Now, when we look at the Gospel of Matthew, we see it's so organized, therefore he must have wrote it. Like, what, like what reasoning is that? But that's, that's one of the things. And then they'll say, no, no, the Gospel of Matthew talks a lot about money. And Matthew... In, in the Bible, he is a tax collector. That's why he's speaking about money a lot. I don't include that one there. So these are evidences, as you can see, they're not very strong to tell us that Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, wrote. This is the evidence that they'll provide. They have a few other evidences, but really, you're going to look at this. If, if, if you ask the Christian, how do you know Matthew wrote this book, this book that we have, he's going to tell you these three or four evidences, and he's not going to have much beyond that. So that's Matthew. According to the Christian, the disciple of Jesus, Matthew, wrote this. The next one, the Gospel of Mark. So who is Mark? Was he a disciple of Jesus? No. According to the Christians, Mark was a young child at the time of Jesus. Um, his mother's house was used as a base for the Christians. So he never met Jesus. Even according to the Christian, this is a very vital piece of information, Mark never met Jesus. Even the Christian will tell you, Mark was a small child, he never lived with Jesus, he never met Jesus, but he wrote this gospel. So where, then you'll ask him, so where he got all his information from if he never met Jesus? They'll say, no, he spent time with another disciple called Peter. So in our terms, we'll say that Mark is like a tabi'i, and he spent time with this, uh, the disciple Peter, and from there he learned all his information. But remember, very important, there's no proof for this. This is a church tradition. There exists no proof for it. And he also accompanied Paul on some of his journeys. Now, who's Paul? We're going to go through this one more time. Paul was that person, never met Jesus, never studied under a disciple, claims to have a vision of Jesus. And now, out of the 27 books in the New Testament, he's written 13 or 14. But he never, ever met Jesus. So Paul, in our understanding, is the person who really was the first corrupter of Christianity. So, the second gospel is the gospel written by Mark. Who's Mark? He never met Jesus, but he met some of the disciples of Jesus, so he wrote a gospel. Right, so we're just going to go. Again, what's the evidence for his authorship? You ask the Christian how you know Mark wrote this book here, because this book has no signature, it has no author's name. So what's your dalil, what's your evidence for this? Again, he's going to tell you, no, no, Eusebius quotes Papias saying that Mark wrote the gospel. That's number one evidence. And he'll tell you, but you know, the, 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 the church, the early church fathers, they believe this, so I believe it. Again, there's not a lot of evidence for his authorship. So those are the first two Gospels. So Gospel of Matthew, according to them, is a disciple. Gospel of Mark, according to them, Mark is not a disciple. He just met the disciples of Jesus. Who's Luke? Luke is another person who's not a disciple. He never met Jesus. He's known for being a doctor or being good with medicine. So now you can imagine what, what's going to be the evidence that the Gospel of Luke was written by Luke because it talks a lot about medicine. And this person, Luke here, was known for being a doctor, therefore he wrote it. So that's, again, it's not, it's not a very strong, not a very convincing argument. And they'll tell you that the early church believed that he wrote it, so we believe that he wrote it. So let's go through it again. Matthew, disciple of Jesus, according to the Christian. Mark, not a disciple, but he met the disciples. Luke, not a disciple, but he met the disciples. This is the official Christian version, which we're going to break down just now. But we need to understand what they're saying before we break it down. Understand that. And the last one is the Gospel of John. Now, John, in the, when you read the Gospels, is a very close disciple of Jesus. He's with Jesus at certain places where no one else, no other disciples are there besides him, Peter, and a few other disciples. John is there. 
And he was known to be a fisherman. He, in, 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 the, in, in the Bible it says he wasn't a very educated person. He wasn't known for being very intellectual. And this is a very important point when we're looking at the Gospel of John. That remember the disciple John, the Hawari, the, 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 the Sahabi of Jesus John, who's disca- discussed in the Gospel, he's, dis- he's described as being uneducated. He's described as being a fisherman, not someone who's very literate. So just keep that point in mind. Now, for this gospel, they do have a little bit of evidence to prove that John wrote it. Because if you read the end of this gospel, it says, This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down, and we know his testimony is true. So if you read this last verse of the gospel of John, it seems to be claiming that a disciple wrote this. So this is now strong evidence that at the end of the gospel, it's actually saying that a disciple wrote this. Now, it doesn't say who it is, but it's saying, it's sort of saying, and we'll discuss that, that a disciple wrote it. So, and in other places, it describes him as the disciple who Jesus loves, and they say this is John, therefore John wrote this gospel. So, this is, if we have to really look at all the evidence provided, only the gospel of John has some evidence that's worth considering because there is a verse in the gospel of john that says this is the disciple who testifies to these things so there is something we need to give an answer to there if we're going to give an answer right now before we go to the response of the modern scholarship let's just again reflect on what we've read the christian believes that the four gospels two of them were written by direct disciples of jesus matthew and john The other two were written by people who met the disciples, Mark and Luke. So we have that in mind. That's the main thing that we need to remember. Now, what's the response of modern scholarship? So modern scholars today don't accept any of this. But remember, we as Muslims, we don't necessarily agree with everything modern scholarship says. Because if you have to look at what some modern scholars have to say about the Quran and who wrote the Quran, we don't accept that. So it's important to remember whenever we're quoting secular sources, we're quoting current modern scholarship, their word is not proof on its own. Because if you read what they say about Islam, they say a lot of things we don't accept. But we'll use their works and look at it, see does it make sense, does it not make sense, and we'll accept and reject from there. So it's very important because if you're going to tell a Christian, see all the modern scholars today, they all agree that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those people never wrote those Gospels, if you're going to tell him that. He's going to just turn around and tell you, well, they don't believe that the Hadith came from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also. So, you know, so then you're going to be stuck. So you can't use their word as a proof in and of itself. You have to examine the evidence yourself. So how does modern scholarship respond to the proofs that the Christians provided? So the Christians provided... Their proof that Matthew wrote Matthew and Mark wrote Mark was what they had this code from Papias who lived in the year 130, about 100 years after Jesus. He said, no, Matthew wrote a gospel. But if you really look at what he said, he says Matthew compiled some sayings in Hebrew and everyone translated them. That's, that's what he said. He didn't say Matthew wrote the gospel of Matthew. Firstly, he said Matthew compiled some sayings. The Gospel of Matthew is not sayings. It's a whole story in there. It's not only the sayings of Jesus. Number two, the Gospel of Matthew, and now we'll have to quote experts in the field, he wrote this Gospel in Greek. So clearly, Papias here is talking about something else. So this quote that they always bring, no, this early Papias said that he wrote this Gospel, it's not a quote that you can rely on, right? The second point is, this scholar Papias said so many things that Christians don't agree he said that, and you know, uh, when in their story, when Jesus was crucified, then one of the disciples called Judas betrayed him. He betrayed Jesus. And eventually this disciple went and he hanged himself. That's what Christians believe. Papias says, no, he didn't hang himself. He got so sick and he was cursed by God that he swelled up and he became huge. And he has these fantastical stories that the Christians themselves don't accept. So why are they quoting him here when they don't accept him there? 
So that will be our argument here. That number one, you don't accept him in other, and that's only one example. There are many other examples where they don't accept Papias. But now they want to quote him here, but they don't normally accept him. Number two, his quote doesn't say anything about the Gospel of Matthew. It's talking about something written in Hebrew or Aramaic, whereas this Gospel was written in Greek. And number three, he also said that Mark wrote his Gospel. If we can't trust him with other things, how can we trust him? when it comes to the gospel. So that's how they would generally answer that. It's not a very strong proof anyway. Just think about it logically. If you have someone who's living in the year 120 telling you that Matthew wrote a gospel, we'd want to ask him, what's your proof for it? Your word in itself is not a proof. So we'd want to know what's your proof for that. The other stronger evidence they had was this quote at the end of John, where it says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things. So a Christian will always show you to see, this is written by a disciple. But now we need to have a bit of a discerning eye and read this verse properly. What is this verse really saying? It's saying this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. And then what it says, we know that his testimony is true. So who's the we? The we is the writer of this gospel. The writer is saying that we know that his testimony is true. Therefore, the writer of this gospel is not the disciple. He is saying, I got this here. Eventually, the, the sayings of this disciple came down to me. And this was the things he, he said. And we know. So it's very important when you're reading this. You see, we know that his testimony is true. That's clearly telling you that the writer of this is not that disciple. He's a different person. So that's there. And the other very important piece of evidence to bring into this is remember last week we mentioned these are four gospels that christians accept there's tens of other gospels there's a gospel of peter the gospel of thomas the gospel there's a few gospels of thomas in those ones also in the gospel of peter he'll say that this is written by peter but the christians don't accept it over there they say no this is a forgery this is a fake we don't accept it many many gospels that were written two or three hundred years later the author claims to be uh, the disciple of Jesus. He claims to be someone, he claims to be this person, and we don't accept it. Because this was something that people did. If they wanted to write a book, and they wanted people to accept their work, then what they'll do, they'll say, if I put someone famous, his name there, then people will read this book and they'll accept it. So they used to forge people's names there. It was an ongoing thing, and there's no reason to think that this is any different. So that's there. Now, that's, those were the responses that scholars will give to the proofs of the Christians. There's no real proof that they had in any case, but those are the, the responses we will provide. Now, what now, evidence, this is a, this is a really, really interesting, interesting section, section. What, what evidence, evidence do we have to show, to show that these Gospels were not, not written by those, by those people? people? Let's look at that. That's some interesting uh, findings they have here. So there's something called the synoptic problem. So synoptic means one-eyed. So what they're really trying to say is Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Why they call that? Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke copy from one another word for word. If you look at some stories, look at Matthew's version, look at Mark's version, the exact same thing word for word. Imagine if I gave you an exam and I gave you five questions, I gave you five questions, you got, you got all right, you got all right, but the words you write will be different. You'll use a different wording, he'll use a different wording. If you have the exact same words, and he has the exact same words, what the teacher will think? They copied. They're copying from one another. So this is the, the conclusion that modern scholars have come to, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were copying from one another because there's exact word-for-word -word replication of many passages. Now the question that comes about is, who copied from who? So that's the question. Now all of this is building up to our case that we can prove that these people that you claim, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't write these. Obviously we're only talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels for now. But remember, it's proven without doubt that they were copying from one another. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. And we look at one or two passages coming up just now. But who copied from who? So it's a bit difficult to decide. Now if I look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they got the same passages, but how do I decide who's the one that's copying from who? So that's a whole subject on its own. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to explain. Maybe if we have time at the end or someone's curious, we'll discuss it. But when scholars really examined it and they looked at it, they saw that Matthew is copying from Luke. Uh, sorry, Matthew is copying from Mark and Luke is copying from Mark. 
So what does that mean? That means Mark is the source of the four Gospels. Matthew is copying from him. Luke is copying from him. Right. Now remember this because it's going to be very important when we're putting our objections towards them. So therefore we know Mark was written first and this was a source for the other two. And there are many examples, we're going to look at some, where you can see Matthew is copying from Mark, but he doesn't like what Mark wrote, so he changes it a bit. Or Luke is copying from Mark, but he feels like, no, I don't like the story, let me just change it a little bit. And we're going to go through some examples now. So here's an example of verbatim copying word for word here. They almost exactly here. So Mark says, but when, and, and the reason why, there's, there's too many passages, there's hundreds of passages if you look at it, but I chose this passage for a reason. So here they talk, Jesus is predicting the future, according to this gospel, he's telling his disciples what's going to happen in the future, and he says when you see the abomination of desolation, where he ought not to be. Now in brackets, Mark writes, let the reader understand. Then he says, then he continues with Jesus' words, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So Matthew comes, he has Mark as a source. He copies him almost exactly, he adds, by the prophet of Daniel. Now, instead of taking out, let the reader understand, which Mark wrote, it's his words. Matthew copies his word, word for word, let the reader understand, in the exact same place. So he didn't even bother to take out uh, Mark's one. He just copied it there, word for word, in the same place. And you can see the rest of it is almost, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So this is probably the best example to use because even the bracketed part, Matthew copied it word for word. So it's, it's, it's probably a nice example to use. Let's look at some examples where Matthew changes Mark. So this is a story that we like using for Christians that a man comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? How do I get success in the next world? So what does Jesus tell him? Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So a very nice verse to use for the Christians, that Jesus is saying, I'm not even good. Let alone you calling Jesus God. He's saying, I'm not even good. So, but that's not our focus here. So Mark writes this here. Now this is a bit of a, Jesus is saying, I'm not even good. Like he's saying, all good is only for God. It's only God. Now Matthew reads this. And he's thinking, but that's not, uh, that doesn't sound right. So he changes it a bit. He says, so he has the same story. Teacher, what good thing must I, now he changes it. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now Jesus' response is, why do you ask me about what is good? So in the first story, he called Jesus good. And Jesus said, no, I'm not good. Matthew didn't like that. So now he changed the wording a bit. And he said, no, you know what? Uh, now the person asks, Tell me about the good things I must do. And then Jesus said, no, why are you asking about good things? So he just changed that a bit. Why? Because he didn't want Jesus to say, I'm not good. So this, examples, this is just one example we chose, where Matthew will look at Mark and then change it. Luke changes Mark. So in the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus is on the cross, and we're going to discuss all of this crucifixion and that later, but just our, our point is yeah, how, they, how they change it and how they alter it. So at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You must have heard Ahmed Dida quoting this in the very famous verse. So Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is telling God, Why did you forsake me? Now that's, how can Jesus, he is God, how can he say that? It's not, it's not sitting right. So when you look at Luke's version, he, he now in the, in the version of Mark, Jesus is like, he gave, he's saying, why you did this to me, God? Why you do? It's, not a, it's not a nice picture. That Luke doesn't like what he's saying. So he says, see how he changes the whole thing. He says, Father, into your hands I, com I commit my spirit. Now Luke changes it. So now Jesus is not in grief. He's happy. He gives up his, he gives up his life. This is how he changed, he changed the whole thing because he didn't like how it was being used. So there's a lot of examples like that. I just chose these two because they, they're quite clear. Now... So we understood this whole synoptic problem. What's the synoptic problem? We have three Gospels that are copying from one another, clearly, no doubt about it. And who is the original in this year? Mark is the original. Matthew and Luke are copying from him. Now let's relate this to the authorship. So you, as a Christian, we're addressing a Christian, you believe that Matthew was a direct disciple of Jesus. If he was a direct disciple of Jesus, why does he need to copy from Mark? Because remember we saw now in the synoptic, Matthew is copying from Mark. According to you, Mark is not a disciple. He never really spent time with Jesus. Matthew is one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Why must he copy from Mark if he was there for all of those incidents? Understand this proof. 
This is the strong, well, not the strongest, but it's a very strong proof that if you claim a disciple wrote this who lived through all of these incidents, why would he need to copy from someone else who wasn't even there? It doesn't make any sense when that's there. That's the, basically our, our main proof that we'll throw out. The second one is that when you're reading this Gospel of Matthew, and he's talking about Matthew, if I was talking about myself, I'll say, I did this and I did that. Let's read the Gospel of Matthew. What does it say? As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Does that sound like Matthew is writing that? It sounds like someone else is writing that about Matthew. They say, no, no, Matthew is talking in the third person. That's a way that it used to be spoken. Okay, fine. But it just, if you're going to be honest and open about it, it doesn't look like an account that's written by Matthew that he's talking about himself in the third person. And the third thing to remember is they have no evidence to show that it's Matthew. Because Papias' quote we saw was wrong. There's no real other evidence besides some people two, three hundred years later said it. So they don't really have any evidence. And we've got quite solid evidence to show that Matthew copied from Mark. So he can't be a disciple. It's not going to make sense. Now, Obviously, I just want to add a condition here that you need to remember that the discussion here goes way more in depth. We're just like scratching the surface, but we're getting an idea of the sort of back and forth that will happen around these topics. But it goes much, much, much deeper in every single one of these Gospels. Now, what's the problem with Luke? So, here, just for us to know, they, again, they have no evidence that Luke wrote this. But according to them, Luke and Paul were travel companions. They used to travel with one another. They knew one another very well. But when we read Paul's writings, his version of the crucifixion, he doesn't even know about the empty tomb and the woman, all of these details of the crucifixion that are in Luke. So if it, this was the same Luke, it's not really going to make much sense. And let's just read the first four verses of Luke. This is Luke's gospel, how he starts it off. He says, many have undertaken to compose an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by the initial eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So look, this is Luke. He's starting off his gospel like this. He's writing it for someone who has some doubts in Christianity. He's trying to prove to him that Christianity is true. He's starting off and he's telling you, I'm not an eyewitness. Whatever I'm writing here wasn't given to me by eyewitnesses. It was handed down to us by eyewitnesses. So if you, if you just read the first four verses of Luke, you'll understand that this wasn't a person who saw what happened. This wasn't a person who met someone who saw what happened. This was someone who heard stories, went around collecting all the stories of Jesus and put it in his book. Some of them will be right. Some of them will be wrong. That's our view on these Gospels. And another important thing to remember also is that everyone agrees that whoever wrote this Gospel of Luke, we don't know who he is. The Christians are saying it's Luke. We don't really know who he is. But he is also the author of the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is the book which discusses the biography or certain events of the disciples. This, this per, the same person wrote both. How do we know? Because of the way they wrote, the words they used, the style they wrote. And we know the author is the same. But we don't exactly know who he is, as we can see here. It can't be the Luke that Christians are claiming it was. Now, what about the Gospel of John? So we saw that that verse in the Gospel of John cannot be referring to the disciple. John is referring to someone after that. But what's our... Now, remember we said that John, in the, gospel, in the Bible, it mentions that he's uneducated, he's a fisherman. This Gospel of John is written in a very intellectual, sophisticated style, a high language of Greek. There's no way some fisherman who's uneducated could have been able to write this high level of Greek. Also, it includes a lot of Greek philosophy that you have to be very well educated, very well studied, especially at that time, to write certain of the things that are in the Gospel of John. So everyone will agree that, you know what, the disciple of Jesus who was uneducated, who was a fisherman, there's no way he wrote this Gospel. It's like, it's like out of the question that such a sophisticated piece of writing could have been written by someone who was at that time. This is, and also third person references, as we mentioned with Matthew, when you're reading the Gospel of John, and he's talking about John, he doesn't say, I, we, went. He says, no, John was here, John said this, John. Now, if you yourself, you're not going to talk like that. It could be a style that people used, but again, it's not, it's not what you'd expect from someone, who is, it's what you'd expect from a third person writing about this. So, 
this is like the overview of the back and forth that's going to go between you and a Christian if you're going to try and convince him that, you know what, these four Gospels were not written by who you're saying they were written by. Now, what's some other things we need to consider? Why do these Gospels contradict one another? We've got a whole section coming up where we're going to show how he, uh, Matthew said this happened, but Mark said this happened, and it's contradicting one another. There's a lot of these, hundreds of these contradictions in, in the Gospels. If they were actually written by people who were there, they wouldn't contradict each other that much. That's the one thing to remember. The second thing is you'll see in like the Gospel of Matthew, they have these amazing events that happen. Everyone wakes up from the grave uh, and certain like crazy things happen. But it's only in one of the Gospels. But if another disciple wrote that, he would have seen that he would have also recorded it. So how does it make sense that only one of them has these huge events that the other ones don't have? The third thing which we're going to discuss now in the next five minutes is that these Gospels are dated to between the year 70 and 100. So Jesus was taken up to heaven in about the year 33. These Gospels were written between 70 and 100. Unlikely that, and we'll see why just now, unlikely that the disciples who were living right there would have waited till the year 70 and 100 to write, to write, to write these Gospels. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So our question is this, which makes more sense? That the actual disciples of Jesus wrote these books and they contradicted one another and they copied from other people, does that make more sense? Or does it make more sense that, you know what, these four authors of these four Gospels, we don't know their names, we don't know who they are, they were living from around the year 70 to 100. Whatever stories of Jesus came to them, they wrote it, they collected it, they collected his sayings. Some would have been right, some would have been changed. That makes far more sense. That as generation to generation, they passed on the stories of Jesus till it came to these four Gospels now, the authors here, who we have no idea who they are. They wrote down the stories, and that's why their stories contradict one another. Their stories are not always conforming, because they just wrote down whatever was available to them at the time. But obviously, we're still going to call it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even though we know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't write, write these Gospels. But when I'm referring to it, I'm going to say Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we know now that these were not the people that wrote these Gospels. Just, so just keep that in mind. Now... How do they date, how do modern scholars find out when these Gospels were written? So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but there's two things when we're talking about an ancient document. So the one is, when was the original written? When did Matthew actually write his Gospel out? That's our one consideration, which we're talking about here. The second consideration will be that, see, Matthew wrote his original. We don't have the originals of any of these Gospels. We have a copy. He gave it to someone who copied it, someone who copied it, someone who copied it. We got a copy from about 300 years later. So that's a whole other section which will be coming later. We're talking about the original. So though the copy that we have today in front of us, if we want to find out when it was written, they do the carbon dating to it. They can find out, okay, it was written in the 400s. But we want to know the original of this. Matthew, but it's not Matthew, we know. The, the author, when did he actually write this gospel? So we have to look at certain factors. We have to become like, you know, detectives and try and think, okay, if this is here, that must mean this, and try and piece things together. So this dating of the gospels is very subjective. Some people say it was written in the year 40. Some say 140. There's a lot of different opinions, but we're going to go with what modern scholarship basically accepts in today's time. So the first proof they use is that Paul, now remember we said Paul's 14 letters make up, uh, he wrote about 14 epistles in the New Testament. When he's writing in those, uh, in those letters, he hasn't heard of these Gospels as yet. And he was a precise person, he knew what was happening in the Christian world, and we know when he wrote. He wrote from about the year 40 till about the year 60. In all of his writings, he has no idea about these Gospels. And he was someone who had traveled around the entire Christian world. If there were going to be Gospels, he would have known what was in those Gospels. He would have known about them. Yet Paul has no idea of them. So we know that they were written after Paul. That's, so our bottom India is the year 60. It had to be written after the year 60. Then the church fathers begin to talk about these four Gospels. Let's just say I got here 120, but really speaking 150 or so. So we know it was written before 150 and after the year 60. Anywhere in between there. And the third one now is the destruction of the temple. So this is a very, it's a bit of a 
technical issue, but let's just try and understand it. So the Jews were worshipping in the temple in Jerusalem, which is now Masjid al-Aqsa, you know, Masjid al-Aqsa in, in, in Palestine. The Jews had their temple there at this, this time. This time was before Masjid al-Aqsa was built. The Jews had their temple there. They were worshipping there. But they were not rulers. The Roman Empire were the rulers. Now, the Roman Empire in the year 70 destroyed the entire Jewish temple. They wiped, they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple in the year 70. Right. Now, these four, these, or let's just say the, the three Gospels, they predict that this temple is going to be destroyed. Now, a modern scholar of today's time, generally, generally, he's a atheist, atheistic beliefs. So if he sees that, hey, this gospel is talking about the temple being destroyed, which happened in the year 70, it can't be a miracle that he predicted it. Therefore, it must be written after 70. Understand how the modern historian is thinking. We don't accept this, but the modern historian is thinking that this gospel is telling us about how the temple was destroyed and what's going to happen and the soldiers are going to come and destroy it. But it's not possible for someone to predict the future. Therefore, the gospel must be written after the year 70. That's the line of reasoning they're using. We, on the other hand, will say, no, it's, it's very possible. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam predicted so many things. It's possible for Isa Alayhi Salam to have predicted it. It is possible that Isa Alayhi Salam told his disciples that the temple is going to be destroyed. So we don't generally accept this sort of reasoning. The third thing to consider is the synoptic issue, that whenever Mark was written, Matthew was later, Luke was later. So we have to take that into account. And then internal evidences, the words that they use, the descriptions that they use. So I just got a small timeline here of how modern scholars look at it. So they look and they see that, okay, 49 to 60, Paul is writing there. He didn't know about the Gospels. The Gospels were recognized here in 120, and the Gospels talk about the temple destruction, therefore they had to have been written after it. Now whether we as Muslims accept that reasoning or not, we can maybe talk about. But so modern scholars dated between the year 70 and 120. And because we know Mark was the source, so they have Mark written at 70, Matthew between 80 and 85, Luke the same. And John, because of the style, the sophistication, these things only came about much later. So they say the year 90 and 95. But again, it's, it's a subjective thing, but generally modern historians accept this. So that's as far as we're going to go now. Today's talk is basically over. But remember that the, the point of this is to get an understanding of these four historical documents because these have all the information about Jesus that the Christian is going to use is going to come from these four Gospels. So we need to understand who really wrote them, around where were they written. They were written about 40 years after Jesus. How much of change must have happened in that that space of time, you know, as like, you know, if, if a story happened, I told someone, he told someone else, he told someone else, he told someone else, by the time it gets to the 10th person, the story is completely different. So a similar thing would have happened here, you would expect that by the time the story comes to the person who wrote the Gospel of Mark, it'll be different from the original that happened. So we have this sort of understanding here. And basically, and basically now, now summary, summary or whatever, whatever we've discussed, discussed in the course, course of our so we can get, get ourselves track, track, track. We, we discussed, discussed the Islamic view of Christianity. We discussed, we discussed the three sources of authority in Christianity, which was, was the Bible, the Church, church Fathers, and the councils that they had. Remember the councils where they decided on the Trinity, etc. We discussed the books of the Bible, how it works, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Four Gospels. We discussed when did these books became when, when did they, they, they get, get put, put into one, one book, book which was only really in the and today they discuss who are the real authors, authors. They, are they are not, not Matthew, Mark, Mark, and John, 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 John. And, and when, when they were they dated, they were dated to between 70 and the year 1995. So, Jazakallah I know today we finished a bit late. I had some questions here that Brother Yusuf wanted me to ask you all to write down, but we won't write it down. Just if anyone uh, so the first question is what are the three sources of authority for Christians can anyone remember the answer we'll just go through it like that if, if a Christian uh, the Christian there's more sources of authority but which three sources of authority what proofs do the Christian use that they, that they use as their proofs what's the number one proof that he's going to use what is number one source of authority the Bible right 
and then we said the ecumenical councils and the church fathers. Now, this is more of a reflective question. We discussed the proof that Christians have of who wrote the Gospels. So I want to ask you that do you think those proofs that they have are they convincing or are they not? Do they not make sense? What do you think? You are listening. It doesn't seem it's not very strong. Now, uh, the fifth question I have here is: Which are the synoptic gospels? Okay, why are these gospels called the synoptic gospels? Remember, we we're discussing what's the reason? Not uh, what's what, what's common about these three gospels: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Yeah. Yeah, they copy from one another. So the words are correct, 100%. That's the answer. So these are called the synoptic gospels. Now, this is important for us because these three were copying from one another. So they like represent one tradition. And the Gospel of John is like separate. So sometimes when we're trying to figure out what would have really happened and what wouldn't have happened, we look and see where they agree with one another, where they disagree with one another. And the last question I want to ask is because if I don't ask it, someone else is going to ask you. There are a Christian who says, you don't believe in the Bible, so why are you quoting the Bible? So how are you going to answer the question for me? We're going to end off on that. Even your own answer. If someone, the Christian, you tell the Christian, you know, Jesus says that the Father, I am not good, only God is good. The Christian will tell you, why are you quoting the Bible if you don't believe in it? Right, so, we, so we, to an extent we do accept that these Gospels will have certain correct information. But, but we, we try, try, we try, try to show you that your understanding, understanding of these four Gospels is wrong. Four gospels is that's wrong. one of the reasons. That's, that's one of the reasons. The, reasons. the, Quran, the, Quran, tells us, the Quran tells us that, 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 that the description of the Quran is in these Gospels. It is going to be in the Bible. Therefore, we will quote you for that. And the main reason why we're going to show you as a Christian that your understanding of the Gospels is wrong. And we don't have to believe in a document for us to quote it as a historical historical. That's the main reason. Amazing. You, you don't, don't have don't to have believe, believe that this is from God, God to quote it, it as a historical source. I understand that. But it would not be that you do believe because you believe in the original script. Yes, we believe in the original. Correct. But I think if you just say you don't believe in it, hmm. then that might also be critical. Yeah, so we're saying that one is the originals, which we believe in, Atina ul Inji. Then we know that changes happened over time. But now we're discussing this Bible in front of us today. So we believe that it has pieces of truth in it. It has information from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No doubt was captured in there. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we have accept every single thing that's written in there. Because certain changes happened. And if you want us to show you the changes that happened, it's very simple. And I showed you some of the changes that, that occurred here. Uh, another, we just one more point to think about. That Remember we showed you that when Matthew took from Mark, he copied him and he changed it. Remember we saw that. And we saw that Luke took from Mark and he changed him. So what does that tell you about what Matthew and Luke thought about Mark? Did they think that Mark was from God? Did they, did they think that what Mark wrote was from God? No, because they would have never changed it otherwise if they thought it was from God. So something to just think about, that if they felt they could change the gospel, they could change what Mark wrote, that means they never believed this was from God. So these early authors of the gospels, they themselves never believed that this gospel itself directly is from God. Yes, the words of Jesus, the words of Isa a.s. that are there, a lot of it could be true and we believe in that. We believe in the original revelation. But whatever we have here in front of us, we will have to look at it critically and examine it. So it's a bit of a thing to think about but anyway all right assalamu alaikum jazakallah for listening
المجيد الرشيد الشهيد اللطيف الخبير الله الله إلهي أنت الحليم العظيم 